This is Tetris. This is existential graphs. Later in the video, you'll learn how, like Tetris, shapes and positions limit how pieces can and cannot move. My main claim is that manipulating diagrammatic signs in an experimental way results in a helpful gamification of logic. There's been a lot of talk lately about spatial computing. Existential graphs are literally the logic of the future. Charles Sanders Peirce, the brilliant scientist who invented the graphs, wrote, I do not think I ever reflect in words. I employ visual diagrams, firstly, because this way of thinking is my natural language of self-communion, and secondly, because I'm convinced that it is the best system for the purpose. His system starts with a blank space called the sheet of assertion. This sheet is clearly there, in front of us, so whatever we put on it counts as asserted. Here, for example, we can take this icon to assert, I die. If we cut out the sheet, this negates, as in, it is not the case that I die. A cut may be cut, thereby bringing us back to the assertion that I die. Mere juxtaposition in space suffices to express conjunction, so here we have, my head gets cut and I die. Or again, my head gets cut and I do not die. This is enough to express conditionals like, if my head gets cut, then I die. Asserting this diagram is making a bet. Check the world and you'll find no situation where I am beheaded and live. When combined, such claims have logical consequences which can be tested. Suppose one asserts the if-then and claims moreover that my head gets cut. By a diagrammatic manipulation called deiteration, we can remove one sign. And by a manipulation called erasure, we can remove another sign, so as to finally invoke double cut and reveal the conclusion entailed, I die. In typical logics, rules dictate what is allowed. Here, shapes constrain what can be done. The logic is animated by five transformations which guarantee a preservation of truth. You can add or remove a double cut. You can write whatever you want in an already cut or shaded area. You can erase anything on a white area. You can copy-paste anything on the same level or a nested level. You can undo anything that is or could be achieved by the copy-paste of move 4. Take this graph. With every cut, we descend a level. One is only committed to claims from the outside in, but we can discern subgraphs. Where the dog is, it is asserted that P. Where the frog is, it is asserted that not P. Where the pig is, we have R and not Q. What does the fox say? Not R and not Q. The copy-paste of iteration and undo of deiteration are possible because truth and falsehood are unaffected by how often a claim is repeated. The earth is not round. The earth is not round. The earth is not round. It's not getting any flatter. In addition to iteration on the same level, you can iterate on any lower level. However, you must ensure that your copy-paste never has to climb any level. Deiteration says that if something was or could have been iterated, you can remove it. As for insertion, it lets you write whatever you want in already cut spaces. Erasure lets you wipe away anything on a white surface, provided you don't generate nonsensical empty white or gray air bubbles. When you practice this diagrammatic logic, you'll quickly find that it is fun. Most people need to force themselves to practice logic. Games, by contrast, are a reward that we look forward to, out of pure enjoyment. So, what if logic was transformed from something you need to learn into something you want to learn? Logic is not an IQ test, and it is not about suppressing your emotions. Rather, logic is a human tool, letting us extend the limited reach of our thinking. Does the conclusion after the therefore really follow from everything said before? If you're an ordinary human like me, you're probably unsure. So you would probably freak if this was a question on an exam. Importantly though, figuring out whether the conclusion follows requires no knowledge of any particular topic, because reasoning can be about different topics while having the same exact form. The question, then, is how should we represent this logical form? Informal logic looks at reasoning in ordinary language. Formal logic, on the other hand, 
builds custom-made signs for greater precision. People wrongly equate formal logic with the symbolic logic of Frege and others, but this overlooks the powerful diagrammatic logic pioneered by Peirce. Informal logic, using language, is not scary, but not precise. Symbolic logic, using algebra, is precise, but scary. Diagrammatic logic, moving shapes, is precise, yet less scary. Let's apply the tools learned earlier to the larger argument we just encountered. If I take his pawn, then he will take my knight, or he will move his bishop. If he takes my knight, then I will be angry, but his queen will be exposed. If he moves his bishop, then my queen will be exposed. If I don't take his pawn, then my queen will be exposed. I am going to take his pawn, or I am not going to take it. The game consists in transforming these premises step by step to get the conclusion either his queen or mine will be exposed. Game on! Finding a correct sequence of transformations is challenging, but it's a good kind of challenge. Speaking of fun challenges, go from this to this. You'll find a solution in free PDF exercises in classes 7 to 9 of this YouTube course. Talk to you soon!